Hi, I'm Sarah from The Upcoming. A real pleasure to be able to speak to you today. Maybe begin with a brief introduction to this amazing film, Aldo. What can people expect when they watch it? Well, first of all, I just hope they get a great story. And, um, and I'm very lucky to be sharing this in interview with, with Claire, who plays a fantastic character in a film called Laura. And uh, we've got remarkable actors in it. Um, some people from, from the northeast of England and some from, from Syria. And the story tells of two communities, both have had very different and, and, and troubling experiences, but the, the people in the, in the villages are living in the aftermath of the 1984 strike. Um, and, and much more also the austerity from 2007. The banks have closed down, the post office have closed down, the swimming pools, the fire brigade, the police, everything has pulled back. And they've kind of really been abandoned. Property prices have massively dropped. The people who have lived there have lost their, you know, value to their, their one asset. And uh, and some really um, despicable initiatives by other local authorities down south, sending families who they deem to have problems without support, sending them up there because the housing is cheap and just to get rid of them. So the people who live there all their lives feel dumped upon. And then what happened was, in many of these areas too, because the housing is cheap again, they sent um, Syrian refugees traumatised by the war there. And then, um, so some held out the hand of friendship and some didn't, it was a very mixed response. And then, um, so digging around these areas, I met some remarkable activists and people who held out their hand to support them, but not only to support the people from Syria, just to try and understand the anger and the fear and the misinformation and build community between them. So I met some people with tremendous skills, very, very creative, you know, and to me they were the salt of the earth. So we just felt like this was an enormous canvas. There were so many nuances, so many things to kind of try and untangle. And uh, so we created a little story in the middle of all this. And um, and uh, and here we are, we had the premiere last night. So it was lovely after four years graft to share it with the people who inspired us, the people who made it, the cast, the crew, and the actors too. Of course, you've been working with Ken Loach for, for such a long time. Um, but particularly, I guess you could maybe see, you know, I, Daniel Blake, and Sorry We Missed You, as maybe part of a kind of trilogy, you know, looking at austerity, the gig economy, and now kind of immigration. Um, what was kind of the, the driving force behind telling this story, and, and why specifically now? Um, well, I suppose after I, Daniel Blake and Sorry We Missed You, they're both tragedies, you have to be truthful to the premise on those characters, but we did want to examine examine the notion of hope. It's been the subtext to many of our films in the past. You know, where do we get that? How do we find it? You know, and hope is political, because when people are hopeful, they're making a plan. But hopeful has got different levels and different levels to it. You know, it's got the intelligence to disentangle, to try and understand people, to listen to people. Then there's the empathy, to put yourself in those other people's shoes and imagine their lives. And then there's the graft, the solidarity. And um, and this is how I, how I met Claire. She was one of these remarkable people who are doing that in their daily work, doing the tough work. And um, and I suppose the film is a, is a, it, it examines where we draw, draw hope from. And, and it's not open, not as empty fist in the air way. But if we are going to make sure that the far right doesn't come in and take advantage with our simplicity, with our violent language, with our stereotyping, with our dehumanised nation of people, if we don't, if we don't compete with them, they will move in. And I'm just back from Dublin now, showing screenings there. You know, there's there's teams of of right wing organisers there demonstrating outside hostels, terrorising already terrified people, telling lies about them, misinformation, attacking them. You know, so is that the world we want to live in? You know, so we have to compete with them. And I met some brilliant people who are doing that. Tell us a bit about your relationship with. Ken Loach, um, his films, and how you've kind of, I guess, orbited like his work, and then finally having the chance to to take on a role in in this film. Yeah, um, I don't know if I have orbited his work, but after the premiere of Sorry We Missed You, um, my colleagues and I were, were community organisers. We worked to bring people together where they might have otherwise perceived themselves as different, in order to find issues of shared concern. What makes you angry? What's putting pressure on you and your families, your community? find out what people have in common to help them organise around those justice issues. That's kind of my day job. And um, we knew that we had something to offer into the space of people coming out of, I, Daniel Blake, but also, and especially Sorry I Missed You, people coming out feeling angry, frustrated, what am I going to do? 
to act in competition to the far right. I love the idea of me being in competition with the far right. That's my kind of reason for being, I think, as a mixed race working class last from Sunderland. So we did some campaigning workshops, some organising workshops after pe people were coming out of those screenings, handing out our flyers, angry about poor working conditions, come and we'll show you. We'll show you what to do about it. And we ran those workshops surrounded by um, aid and support rates of you all, Sarah and I. Did you not know that? I thought that's how Sarah knew you. So yeah, I kind of orbited unbeknownst <laughs> since then, but, but met Paul in the research for the film. Um, was introduced to Paul when I was a community organiser still, but um, by a colleague who was aware of a previous job I had working with young people who have been drawn into the politics of the far right. Um, I'm kind of fascinated with that subject, being a young person from a post-industrial community, mm -hmm. hearing about our glorious past of industry, but also trade union organising. Often, by the way, it was a glorious past of men. <laughs> we don't really get to hear about the women's role <laughs> in the strikes, for example. So I'm, again, I'm really glad you brought that in. But yeah, only about the glorious past, nothing about what our future could be. Um, I was part of a brain drain that left but every time I came back, it was looking worse. There were swat stickers on the walls. People's faces were looking more and more downtrodden. And so I've been, kind of been fascinated with that dynamic. And I also have a kind of yeah, visceral reaction to um, anti-immigrant and um, Islamophobic rhetoric, being a granddaughter of a migrant who lived in a Muslim community. So I've always wanted to explore that, ended up working in it, and then had the pleasure of having a conversation with Paul about it when he was in write, writing this film exploring those issues um, and the young people who I used to work with their outward expression was of racism the stuff they were writing on their sheets the reason they came to me was because they were saying racist things but when I said what makes you angry what are the big issues for you they'd be saying there's no houses and there's no jobs and that isn't the fault of my granddad that isn't the fault of Fatima or Yara um, so it was a privilege to meet Paul and I thought that would be it actually and now here I am. <laughs> yeah. And tell us a bit about your character of Laura. How did you kind of see her? How could you relate to her? Or did you prepare to play her? You know, it's kind of a force of nature in, in lots of ways. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, my, I mean, my character really cares, doesn't she? She cares about the community that she grew up in and she's bringing her children up in. She didn't do the brain drain thing. She stayed. Um, I met people when we were preparing for the film from Easington, from Merton who had stayed and they'd fought. And I like to think that although I left, I've, I've come back and I'm fighting. Um, and I brought their spirit and hopefully a bit of mine into the character as well. Um, but not only is she fighting for our own community, it's not, she just hasn't got this kind of charity big in the home and only look after your own approach. And uh, she sees a shared humanity in the people who've arrived into the space because they're fleeing war and persecution. I would like to think she's also seeing that shared humanity and migrants who come for economic purposes as well, because also human. Um, lots of British people migrate for economic purposes. I've done it, still human. Um, so <laughs> she's she's trying to like, find those spaces of, of solidarity, it, of shared humanity. That's, that's, that's why she's in the film, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I like to think that I'm not too dissimilar mm. to Laura, even if she makes some decisions that I maybe wouldn't. Mm. <laughs> and in terms of what you hope people take away from the film, it does feel like, you know, this issue, whether, whether or not we want it to, it just keeps coming back as, as the, the main thing that seems to be dividing us as a country, you know, being forced down our throats in a way by the political narratives. So it feels like one that's re it's really urgent to unpack, but a lot of people maybe are a bit afraid of tackling it. And, and, and that's why films like this are brave um, and perhaps you know, it's not as easy to say there's the good guys and the bad guys, you know, and villainizing people doesn't help. Actually, it's perhaps, you know, giving that sense of hope and hopefully that sense of shared humanity, which is really crucial. I think the, the idea, as I've been thinking about the film, that's been particularly resonating with me is that there aren't necessarily bad people. There are bad politics and bad policies and 40 years of political and economic disenfranchisement and the systemic um, negligence to teach people about our politics and our country, the, the legacy of colonialism and, and to date. Um, and we could go into all that, people probably wouldn't watch it. Um, it's to see that manifest through a character like Charlie, I think was quite important. People expect characters like Laura, people like me to be like right on 
on the sides of, I would like to think that they were on the sides of both. And so we're easier to write off. But I think the Charlie character is really important because the messages of the right, um, the messages that the government are currently pushing upon people to justify their bad policies are aimed at people like Charlie. They're not aimed at me. Um, so to see the nuance brought out in his character, a good guy, downtrodden, fallen into the traps um, that have been laid for us as working class people in post-industrial cities, I think was really important. And also that there's just that glimpse of him coming back around, making his own mind up. Um, and I hope that's what people do, watch it with an open heart and make their own mind up. Charlie was very important, you know, and you know, how, how do good people like that you know, how do they lose the layers of self-confidence? How do they lose their empathy? How do they become harsh? How do they become poisoned? How do they dehumanise people? There's a line there, and well, no spoilers, I suppose, otherwise it's, it's not good for people to see it. But what we wanted to do was have a range of characters. You know, there were some who were steeped in the minor strike, some who would, be, who would you know, who were who would deemed to be scabs or sons of scabs. So those, 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 those divisions are still there in those communities even to this day, and then. Um, and we, so we wanted to kind of, there was so much going on really, you had to try and have a sense of an iceberg underneath because there's so many characters there, so many voices, you know, and we also wanted to connect it up with the other films. You mentioned earlier about your question about um, Sorry We Missed You and I, Daniel Blake, the third film being there and as a trilogy. And we wanted to try and weave in notions there as well because I don't think you can understand the world of I, Daniel Blake, a systematic cruelty against someone in need, you know, or or the, how someone works a 12 or a 14 hour day in a gig economy, you know, thinking he's an entrepreneur of the road, a warrior of the road, you know, disenfranchised, separated from other workers. Unless you understand what was lost with that 1984 strike, people had an eight hour day there. How many people would bite your hand off today for an 18 hour day? I wouldn't be surprised if, if you were a freelancer, I don't want to assume it, but you know, you know, you don't get paid for your traveling time, you know? The, look at all the healthcare workers doing the most important work that we can do, looking after our oldest and most vulnerable people. They get paid two hours in the morning, three hours at lunchtime, another three hours in, you know, in the evening or whatever. You know, getting texts the day before or even in the afternoon to say you know, what your hours will be. How did we lose that control? And the right... In fact, there's an, an interview today in, 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 in one of the radio BBC programmes. It was, it was almost like the implication is that, well, that's like... That's like nature, it's like the weather. That's the way the world is and you have to accept it. No, we don't have to accept it. It's political choices. It's like Claire said, it's systematic. Poverty is a choice. We've got the two, uh, they've got the two child welfare policies just now shamefully implemented by the Tories and doubly shamefully um, Starmer will not go back on that. Now that condemns hundreds of thousands of children to hunger by just one signing of a pen and changing that legislation, that would take lots of people out of hunger. Scotland have done it, they've got a £25 voucher scheme. They give that to every child on welfare. And the wonderful Danny Dorling, a brilliant professor at Oxford, you know, one of the sharpest academics he, academics he had, I saw his presentation and he said that that £25 voucher sounds small, it's enormous. He said it was the biggest piece of social engineering in the last 40 years. That could be implemented tomorrow and many, many hundreds of thousands of children and families could be taken out of hunger. So it's a political choice, it's not the weather. So how did we come, how did that happen? You know, we lost that, the, the anti-trade union legislation of the Tories, backed of course by Blair who didn't change one dot of it. You know, we've seen the Corbyn, he did try to transform things. Um, there was a possibility of change there. And now we're back to Stammer. In our film, there's the gala. It ends off with a gala, that's a spoiler, I shouldn't say that, but there's a moment, but he was invited to that gala. He didn't go to that gala. But where was he? Very, very soon afterwards, he was at Lord Spencer's house paying tribute to Murdoch, West Streeting and him, highly courted. So it's a safe spare of hands now. So how does, I think we have to ask those bigger questions. How does power operate? Who has their hands on power? If someone challenges power, how they're crushed? You know, what happened in 1984? You know, we've got to be critical citizens. We've got to be able to untangle complex issues. If not, we'll end up like Trump. We'll end up like, you know, the United States where 40% of Republicans believe that climate change is a left-wing, you know, conspiracy. So in other words, we've got to embrace complexity. 
and say, right, okay, let's untangle it, let's work together, let's nourish each other, and let's find hope, because hope is political. Because if you lose that, you just retreat, and like TJ sends in that scene at the end, you know, we just like, it's, you know, you care about your family and your community, and then it's the rest of it's the law of the jungle. And now with climate change, and so many people on the move, and so many wars, those are really, really principles, you know, that are going to inform our behaviours. And, um, and I hope the story somehow can be a catalyst for discussion. Absolutely. And, and just finally, you know, how did it feel to be at that premiere last night? It did feel <laughs> like there was such a, I mean, just even hearing Ken Lowe just talk about the film, you know, it's this idea that he's just got so much conviction and, and the idea of kind of, it's, you know, not necessarily about idealism, but sort of channeling that feeling of anger into something positive and, 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 and film and cinema can be a part of that. Yeah, and I'm glad you said that about idealism. <clears throat> I think I've been accused of being an idealist. I think Laura has been accused of being an idealist. There's power in being an idealist, like there is in, in hope as well, right? You've got to have a resolute determination that things cannot continue the way they are. And to be standing there alongside Paul and Ken and on Thursday night, Rebecca, uh, the producer who couldn't be with us, last night and everyone who'd made the film is just an absolute pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, it's a real privilege to have been part of telling this story in particular and to stand alongside such comrades. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was a beautiful celebration of all of that last night. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for sharing all that with me. Um, I really enjoyed presenting the film um, and I've got lots of other events as well. Thanks so much. Thanks thank for your you. interest.